Hi there, my name is Jason Harlow. Today's video will take you through the last uh, two sections of Richard Wolfson uh, Chapter 4. Okay, and the sections are solving force problems, uh, Newton's third law, the normal force, and Hooke's law. And the quote above is that using Newton's second law with multiple forces is easier if we draw a free body diagram. And just for fun, uh, you see a woman pulling a sled up there. Let's draw the free body diagram for the sled. So you start off by drawing a dot, which just represents the sled. And now we draw all the forces we can think of. So there's the tension force in her string, she's pulling up and to the left. Uh, there would be gravity, the weight of the sled acting down. I guess there would be the normal force from the surface of the floor acting upwards. And there might be some uh, kinetic friction acting backwards. And that's a free body diagram. Okay, so the steps for drawing a free body diagram uh, are number one, identify the object of interest, the thing that the forces are acting on. Uh, list or think about all the forces that are acting on that object. Then you can just draw a dot for the object. And lastly, draw the vectors for all those forces acting on the object with their tails starting on the dot. So let's do an example. Uh, it's example 4.3 from your textbook. A 740 kilogram elevator accelerates upward at 1.1 meters per second squared, pulled by a cable of negligible mass. Find the tension force in the cable. Okay, so the object of interest here is the elevator. Let's draw a free body diagram. The, there's tension acting upwards, the weight acting downwards, and the acceleration we know is 1.1 meters per second upwards. So let's define the y-axis as being plus y is up. So that means the, a, the y component of a is plus 1.1. Uh, so we've got Newton's second law, which in vectors form is f net equals ma. Uh, in the y direction, which is our direction of interest, it's f net y is m times a y, where f net is the tension upward minus the weight downward, and that's going to be equal to m times a y. So we can solve that equation now for t. T equals mg plus may. We can pull out the m. It's m times g plus ay. And now we have all those numbers. So m is 740, g is 9.8, a sub y is 1.1. Plugging into my calculator, I got 80.66 newtons. So to two significant figures, the tension is 8100 newtons. And that's upward. So does that make sense? Well, uh, it's a 740 kilogram elevator. So if uh, if it had been at rest, the, ex the tension to support it would be a little less than 7,400 newtons. Um, we've got 8,100 newtons pulling upwards, and that's more than it's needed just to support it, so it will also accelerate it upwards. So, so that, that sounds good. Okay, so next we're on to Newton's third law. So an interaction is between one thing and another. It always requires a pair of forces acting on two different objects. For example, the hand is pushing on the wall, so the wall is pushing on the hand. That's an interaction between the wall and the hand. Newton's third law of motion says that if object A exerts a force on object B, then object B exer exerts an oppositely directed force of equal magnitude on A. So, example, the hammer pushes downward on the nail with some f force. Uh, there's a, another force of the nail pushing upward on the hammer, exactly the same magnitude force, but in the opposite direction. So sometimes these are called action and reaction. One force is called the action. Maybe the truck hits the car. The, other, the reaction would be the car hits the truck. But these are co-pairs of a single interaction, the truck-car interaction. Neither force can exist without the other. Okay, so it doesn't matter which you call the action, which you call the, the reaction. It's up to you. They're always equal in strength and opposite in direction. And they always act on two different objects. So another way of saying it is to every action, there's always an, uh, an opposite, an opposed equal reaction. So example, uh, the tire pushes backward on the road, reaction is the road pushes forward on the tire, and that's what causes the, the car to, to be propelled forwards. 
So here's a question for you. If you exert a force, F, on a bookcase, uh, the force which the bookcase exerts on you, is it always negative F? Or does it depend on mass, Depend your mass, depend on the mass of the bookcase, depend on the acceleration of the bookcase, or it depends on the speed of the bookcase? Take a pause, think about that, and then I'll tell you the answer. So it's always negative F. That's uh, Newton's third law. I think of it sometimes as if there's a spring between your hand and the bookcase. The spring compresses a little bit. The spring doesn't know which side of the spring is on your hand and which side is on the bookcase. It just pushes equally in both directions. It doesn't matter what your mass is or the mass of the bookcase or if the bookcase is accelerating or moving. The, the two forces are always equal and opposite. Now, not every pair of equal and opposite forces form a third law pair. Uh, example, you've got this block sitting on a table down here. Uh, there's two forces acting on it. There's the weight, F sub G, acting downwards, and then there's the normal force acting upwards. Now, and these, by the way, cancel because uh, they're equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. But they're acting on the same object, so those cannot be a third law pair. They happen to be equal and opposite in this case, but it's not because of Newton's third law. I mean, for example, here's the same block, and now you tilted the table a little bit. In this case now, the normal force is still perpendicular to the surface. It's up and to the right, and the weight is still acting downwards. So these are no longer equal and opposite, and they don't cancel each other. And in, case, uh, in this case, the block will accelerate downwards. Uh, sometimes it's a little unclear as to where the pairs are. For example, if just gravity is pulling this woman downwards, what's the uh, other half of that interaction? Well, it is that she is pulling the Earth upwards. So, and it's, it's a little hard to imagine that, but it's true. It's just that her mass is such that with this force on it, she accelerates downwards uh, at 9.8 meters per second squared. The same force acting on the much more massive Earth causes the Earth to accelerate upwards by like 10 to the minus 24 meters per second squared. It's, it's uh, completely negligible and basically equal to zero. And this figure is not drawn to scale. Okay, so let's do another example. What is the net force on the three kilogram block in this diagram? It's, uh, it's, they're both on some frictionless surface and there's an outside force of five newtons pushing to the right on the one kilogram and an outside force of three newtons pushing to the left, pushing to the left on the three, three kilogram block and they're touching each other. All right, so the object we're being asked about is a three kilogram block and we want to know F net on that block, which is gonna be equal to MA where the mass is three kilograms and the acceleration is the acceleration of that block. So we need to know the acceleration. And keep in mind that the acceleration of the two blocks are, are going to be the same. They're touching each other. So uh, let's first consider both blocks together. Free body diagram of the system, which is the one kilogram plus the three kilogram um, mass. So that dot is both masses now. And there's the force of the floor upwards on them and the force of gravity downwards. These are going to cancel n equals w because there's no y acceleration. And here I've defined y to be up and x to be to the right. So horizontally, there's an external force to the left, 3 newtons, and another external force to the right, 5 newtons. And the forces that are touching each other uh, don't count because they're internal to the system. So the net force uh, in the x direction is going to be uh, plus 5 newtons to the right, minus 3 newtons to the left, equals mAx. Solve that for Ax. Ax equals 5 minus 3 divided by the, ma the mass, 1 plus 3, so it's 2 over 4. That equals 0 0.5, and it's meters per second squared. Okay, so now let's consider just the 3 kilogram block only. We'll draw a free body diagram with a dot. There's the normal force up on the 3 kilogram block and the weight down on the 3 kilogram block. Those are equal and opposite because uh, the y acceleration equals zero. Horizontally, we've got this external force 3 newtons to the left, and now the 1 kilogram block is pushing a normal force to the right, F1 on 3. I don't know how big that force is. Uh, that's unknown. 
uh, but we do know that the F net on three kilogram block equals M times AX. So it's uh, 0 0.5 meters per second squared is AX. Three times three kilograms, all we have to do is three, point three times 0 0.5 is equal to 1.5 newtons. That's the net force on this block. So we've solved it. F net is 1.5 newtons to the right. Uh, we can think about that a little bit. Um, the three kilogram block is being pushed to the left with an external force of three newtons and pushed to the right by the one kilogram block by we don't know how much. And the whole thing, since there's this five newton force from the left, must be being accelerated towards the right. So from this, I would say that the one kilogram block must be pushing with uh, 1.5 more than the three newtons, so 4.5 newtons to the right. So, so it all seems to hang together, and the the uh, I would say the assess look it looks good. Okay, so the last topic today is Hooke's law. So uh, the extension of a spring is directly proportional to the force applied to it. So what you're seeing in this quick animation here is masses hanging from a spring that are hanging from the ceiling or something. Um, if you hang more and more masses, one mass, two masses, three masses, four masses, the more force being pulled down on the end of the spring, the longer the spring gets. So you can think of the displacement delta x of the end of the spring being proportional to the amount of force that the spring, in this case, is pulling upwards to, to support these masses. So just quick vocab here. When something is pulled, like a spring or this bungee, it's in tension. So the tension force pulling upwards on this bungee jumper. Uh, even though the extension of the bungee is actually downwards, this x, I guess, vector is, is down in that case. Uh, you can squish something. So actually here what you can see is the baseball pressing on the bat. So there, there is a little delta x, I guess, of the, or little x compression of the baseball, and the baseball is pushing to the left with this normal force on, on the bat. So a stretched or compressed spring produces a restoring force in a direction that's opposite to that of the stretch or the compression. And if it's an ideal spring, then you have what's called Hooke's Law, which is F sub S equals negative K times X. F sub S is the force of the, the spring. Um, X is the amount or the displacement of the end of the spring. K is called the spring constant in Newtons per meter. And the negative sign is there to remind you that the force uh, exerted by the spring on the object is opposite in direction to the displacement at the end of the spring. So if you, you, know, you push the spring to the left, then the spring uh, pushes back to the right. And springs provide a convenient device for measuring force, and that's what's discussed at the end of Chapter 4. Hi there, me again. Uh, let's just go over the big ideas that uh, were in Chapter 4. So force causes change in motion, not the motion itself. So something can be going a lot of, along at a constant velocity with zero force on it. Uh, next is that uniform motion, straight line constant speed, needs no cause or explanation. Uh, any deviation in speed or in direction requires a net force. And then lastly, this uh, idea that force is always come in pairs. Every interaction consists of uh, two forces acting on two different objects. Okay, so a little bigger now, a little closer. I just want to give you some advice, and the advice is this. You cannot learn physics just by reading, memorizing, and listening carefully. You have to work through the suggested end of chapter problems, and you have to do your mastering physics homework. Think about it this way. You cannot learn to swim by reading a really good book on swimming or by getting some instruction from the best swimmer in the world telling you exactly the steps. If you want to learn to swim, you have to jump into the water and get wet. Well, solving physics problems is a little bit like swimming or playing a musical instrument. It takes a whole lot of practice and you will get better at it as you do more of it. So grab a big stack of blank paper uh, get a pen, 
get uh, a calculator and I don't mean a calculator app I mean an actual calculator like the one that you're going to use in fact the one that you are going to use on my tests and my exam and go through these suggested end of chapter problems if you have a mastering physics homework you know you can print it out or you can write it out on a piece of paper get used to writing these things out and doing things on your own treat them as if they're exam problems seek help uh, if you get stuck but keep in mind you will have to figure out how to get through these on your own eventually and it will get easier with time you'll, you'll make a lot of mistakes at first I know that I did but keep practicing you'll start getting better and you'll start developing your own confidence good luck and see you in class